After putting six past West Ham, surely Arsenal couldn't do it in back-to-back away games in the Premier League, go and smash another team. I predicted 2-1. I thought, yeah, surely not. Surely we're not just going to go on another goal spree. But we did. How are we doing it? How has it all suddenly clicked? I'm going to break it down with my good friend Graham. And we all think Martin Odegaard is a big part of it. Graham, these are getting fun, aren't they? Yeah, great win, James. Yeah, um, the first time Arsenal got in the Burnley half on Saturday, they scored a goal. With the first attack of the second half, Arsenal scored a goal. This was ruthless football, James. In a week as ruthless as I can remember in Arsenal's 138-year history, with back-to-back wins by five goals or more. Eight of Arsenal's 17 wins this season, James, have come by the odd goal. In those games, they've dominated the, the games, but that hasn't been matched by the scoreline. In the last two weeks, that dominance is now being matched by the scoreline. Totally agree. Look, we're going to fly through the match stats because some really good stuff to go through. But Arsenal only 16 shots to Burnley's eight with seven on target. Burnley didn't have a single one. David Ryan may as well have had a cup of tea throughout the uh, 90 minutes. 65.3% possession for Arsenal with many more passes and of course a much better xg of 2.61 outscoring xg that's quite nice um 51 final third entries to burnley's 29 way more deep touches funnily enough the same amount of zone 14 touches so they did try and approach us we clearly dealt with it fairly comfortably and a 66.5 percent field tilt for arsenal uh, they tackled us more they intercepted us more they cleared the ball more but we won the ball back much quicker with 7.7 passes per defensive action to Burnley's 20.1. Now, let's evolve this a little bit. We talk about XG, we talk about filter, all these things. Some people go, what a load of nonsense, come on. Like football, you, you data people are going way too deep into it. That's what I get sometimes. And other people love it. Other people think it's a great way of measuring the game and ultimately these underlying stats eventually catch up over a season. I think you've seen that a little bit with Arsenal's XG. But one thing that I'm going to be really honest, I've always struggled to understand, is expected goals on target. The minute we entered that, even for me, I started to go, is this going too far now? Expected goals, I kind of actually understand, you know, why there's something to that. But expected goals on target, never quite understood. So the expert you are, Graham, is going to break it down. But the reason we're talking about this is because you did some, some really interesting stats that... Arsenal conceded 0.00, nothing in terms of expected goals on target against Burnley, and 0.2 in the previous two games against Liverpool and West Ham. It sounds, in principle, brilliant. What does it mean? It's what Mikel Arteta, I think, has been trying to achieve for the team this season. As you say, XG is expected goals. X got is expected goals on target. The difference between the two models, James, is XG measures pre-shots uh, at goal. X got measures post shots at goal and what that means is it measures the probability of a shot with only the goalkeeper there to save it that's the difference between xg and x got and it's very significant i think because it's what arteta has been looking to achieve this season and that is to minimize shots at arsenal's goal and so less for the goalkeeper to have to do so in the last three games david raya has only had two saves to make and he had no save to make on saturday that's what x got is it's the probability uh, of, of a goal from the shot at target with only the goalkeeper being the, uh, the measuring uh, stick to, to stop that goal. Okay, so is it also, okay, that's interesting. So has it got anything to do as well with, when you say pre and post shot, are you saying pre-shot? Say there's a shot from this area here and it takes into account how many defenders are there, yeah. the striker's probability of scoring, all that, before the ball's been struck. Yeah. But expected goals on target looks at after the ball's been struck and takes into account, takes like into account said, where goal. it is in the box uh, in relation uh, where it is in the box and, and basically the only uh, metric that it measures is whether is it, you know it's about the goalkeeper okay. it's, it's sort of, if your if your x got is low it means the goalkeeper's not having shots to save okay. you're always going to have expected goals because there's going to be positions when teams attack where they're going to get shots at your goal uh, or, or you get a position now. to have a shot at your goal. I get it more now. Okay, fine. Yeah. I get. Okay, that makes a lot more sense. Yeah. Fair enough. So, what is this telling us? That it's so low. Uh, you know, we were talking about it off camera a little bit, but I'm really glad I kind of got this explanation live. I wanted to actually sort of hear it, you know, on on the show and not come in sort of pretending I know it better than I do. But what's this telling us then? That David Rice having very little to do. What it tells us is, I think, that uh, uh, what Arteta, as I said to you when I started talking about this today, it tells us that our, what Arteta's done to this team. Uh, we're going to talk about at the moment he's making us 
more a less predictable in build up which uh, essentially is what Martin Odegaard uh, is now doing for the team but what he's also done is and it really stems back to what was happening at the back end of last season when teams were able to sort of like play through us and get shots at our goal right at our goalkeeper what he's done now is he's made the team uh, so defensively solid off the ball with players close together with uh, defenders who, who dominate their spaces, uh, that, that basically teams are not having so many shots at our goalkeeper. Yeah. And as an, in effect then, the, their chances of scoring goals are less. We, 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 not only are we keeping more clean sheets, I think since David Ray has come in, he's kept, I think, more clean sheets than any goalkeeper in the Premier League. But one of the reasons for that is, is that the, we're not allowing teams to actually have many shots at him. Yeah. And that's what X got is X got is proving the fact that he's making less saves. And I can't remember, and I don't know if you can. I can't remember David Raya making a top save since he's been in the in the team. Maybe that that save he made against Tottenham. Yeah, but, uh, North London derby was one. But yeah, I hear it. So I, I think uh, this. I've seen some he should this, have saved. Th- yeah, one or two. Yeah, but yes, this this. Yeah. I think this is important actually. I know it's, it might be a bit boring uh, for some people, but it just shows that Arteta has now fine tuned this team to to the extent now that we are not allowing teams to uh, have shots at our goalkeeper. Yeah. Uh, and that's been proved in the last three games. He's only had two saves to make. Yeah, totally true. And, and I think the reason it's important to mention is while we're going to talk about 11 goals, the back-to-back, I put that in my intro, you know, who, who would have thought after a 6 0 at West Ham that we'd you know, follow that up with a 5 Who thought we'd follow up the 3-1 against Liverpool with a 6 0 at West Ham? Yeah. But amongst all this, Arsenal have been so brilliant defensively. You know, a, a concentration that's from Saliba, you know, when it comes to Awani's goal. You know, a little bit of something between Saliba and Raya for the Liverpool goal. And we basically have five clean sheets post, you know, the Dubai trip and the, the winter break, which tells you how brilliant Arsenal have been defensively. Um, and again, important to mention because all the credit's going to go to the attack and how brilliant we've been in that sense. But defensively, we've been fantastic. I, I will say that when you uh, get controlling games, which Arteta wants, when you have the amount of possession that Arteta wants, when you're dominating games like we have been, yeah. obviously that's less pressure on the defence. The yeah. They always say the best form of defence is to attack. Yeah. But obviously you have to be in a position that when the ball's turned over, that basically you've, uh, you've got the sort of like quality defenders who, who can win their duels or, or to win their races, or you've got the sort of team set up in transition to deal with teams in transition. And that's mm. what you've done. Yeah, totally agree. So some attacking numbers. 21 goals for Arsenal in our last five games. 14 goals for Arsenal in our last three games. Three times the last five games, Arsenal scored five goals in a match. A plus 19 goal swing in Arsenal's goal difference over the last five games is another key stat there. Over in Arsenal's last 10 matches played in the Premier League, Arsenal scored 25 goals from 23 XG. Nice to see us overscoring the expected goals a little bit, considering it felt for so long that the expected goals were there, but we just weren't putting it in the back of the net. And we did actually, in a previous tactical inside, go through, you know, Arsenal's expected goals, you know, tally, I think, because we put up a really big one against West Ham, didn't we? So, might have been last week, we went through it. Um, a big part of this is this man, Martin Odegaard. And you had a lot of insight on how he's playing this new role. And it, I think we all agree that you'll see it in the thumbnail and the title, we need to give Odegaard some real time on this show because he's a, he's a captain, he's a leader, but he's just such a wonderful player as well. He is, and I think what Arteta's done now, he's given him so much responsibility now in this team to actually, he's almost like the player who decides uh, what, where he's going to be and what he's going to do in the game. He's given him that because he thinks he's so intelligent, he's allowing him now to think for himself on the pitch. You know, we've always talked about Arteta wanting players to play in certain zones and, mm-hmm. and, and there's a structure to the way we build up and all that and he coaches players. But I think Odegaard has now got this almost like this, I wouldn't say it's a free role, but he, he, he basically, well maybe it is because he's involved now in all aspects of our play. And one thing I noticed uh, on Saturday, James, is when Burnley were pressing in a 4-4-2, so if you sort of like move them up, so you've got Ben White yeah. uh, and we've got Kibor, our left side uh, defender, we've got Saliba and uh, Gabriel. So, when they're two forwards uh, uh, that pressing on, right? Mm. So I'll just use the two forwards as an example. And their two wide players will come out to engage with. Uh, yeah. Kivio and White. Kivio and White. So, so what we've got now is, uh, as you see, that they're going man for man. I mean, mm. Arsenal man for man are a stronger team than, than Burnley. So, and, and I think this was a possibly company taking a bit of a risk because basically he wants to go man for man and he's going to press us in a 4-4-2. 
The first thing that Odegaard did, I thought, that I noticed in that game on Saturday is he's now coming short to overload their press. Mm -hmm. So if you think that at the moment it's a 2v2 there and you've got a 2v2 out wide, so it basically company thinks, you know, basically he's got that covered in the press. Odegaard is here with Brown. Odegaard, what I thought was doing quite a lot on Saturday, was coming in short mm -hmm. to receive the ball mm -hmm. and he was taking it and that got us a, an overload around their press straight away. Now you might think, well, why doesn't Brownie will follow him, mm -hmm. you know. But Burnley would have worked on this all week. They wouldn't have thought that Odegaard would be coming short to sort of play round a press. And of course, the danger then is if Brownell goes high, they've overcommitted up high. It also forces centre halves to, to come out from their shape, and it forces them high up the pitch. So I think this was the first thing I noticed about him in build up. He's coming short now to get an overload round a press. So he, he's coming in here. The first yeah. phase of our play is involved in that. Mm -hmm. Now the second part is, and we talked about this last week, mm -hmm. is basically he's forming, he's going into the double pivot, isn't he, with Declan Rice? Should we move players up the pitch? Yeah, so why, we, not? why not? Yeah, if we get Martinelli, Saka up the pitch, yeah. Trossard in that false line, yeah. he's going to float. But you're saying yeah. he's playing that double yeah. pivot yeah. so that Havertz can get yeah. a little bit closer to Trossard. Yeah. And I think this is quite significant, actually, because we talked about him in the first phase of play, coming short to play around the press. He's also dropping into the double pivot. And we're not always building up now because we, we want to be less predictable and build up. So we're not building up in a 3-2-5 now. We're building up in a 4-2-4, Odegaard next to Rice. Now, when he does that, it's very interesting because what you'll find is the moment he does that, and he's, he's on the ball here, that's the license for Ben White to go high mm -hmm. and Saka to come inside. And then you do revert to your five lanes. And you saw it in the, in the goal where he arrived from deep on the edge mm -hmm. of the box to score the first goal. So he's in this phase here in, in build up in a double pivot. So that's the second part of the three things he does in the team. And then you've got this little, no, little triangle going on between White, Saka and Odegaard, which I think is now really important in the team because mm -hmm. basically you'll see sometimes Saka coming inside with White going high. Mm -hmm. You'll also see uh, Saka holding the width. Mm -hmm. White coming in here, even comfortable playing in here when Odegaard's deeper. Mm -hmm. And then when Odegaard comes deeper, White will drop back into the double pivot. So mm -hmm. it's so flexible mm -hmm. in build up, and it's all because of the flexibility and uh, intelligence and skill set of Martin Odegaard that he can play from deep, he can play in the pivot, and he can join the five lanes. Uh, and also, when we stretch uh, the teams high, so as we saw in the first goal, when Trossard and Havertz are, are making those runs, pushing their defenders back. It creates the space for him now to come on the edge of the box, mm -hmm. and that's where he scored his goal from a, a bullet light shot from the edge of the box. But what I really liked on Saturday was the dynamic between Odegaard, Havertz, and Trossard. And, and when Hav Odegaard was in this position, right? Mm -hmm. Now, I thought the Havertz Trossard dynamic was also interesting because um, when Odegaard, Odegaard will be here and Trossard will be here, mm -hmm. right? When Odegaard drops back there, Trossard comes into the right-sided eight roll. Yep. And Havertz is on the left-sided eight roll. Right? Mm -hmm. So now Burnley, it pulls one of their defenders out and creates the gap for Havertz to run into. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened. And what we saw with the penalty, which was the second goal, mm -hmm. we saw, and this dynamic, first of all, you, sometimes you had Havertz running in behind mm -hmm. or holding his lane, or Trossard running in behind. So Burnley were really struggling to understand or predict what Arsenal were going to do. But what we saw with Odegaard pulling the strings from here was him play this delightful ball to Havertz. Now when Havertz has made that run, Trossard, who's now occupying the left right space, is going to then make a late run, which he does, into the box. And then Odegaard plays this beautiful ball through to Havertz, mm -hmm. Havertz which releases Trossard, and that resulted in the penalty, James. Well, you've done an admirable job recreating that bit there. I've, I've done it for you, not there. Here. There you go. <laughs> but you're spot on. Because this is Erdogan playing in an eight position. Now, some people, we talked at you know, the beginning of the show about who were saying that the uh, wannabe tacticos are going too far with expected goals on target, whatever. And I think another criticism of that has been, you know, the, the use of the word six and eight and ten. I think it's a really good way of differentiating a midfielder's role. With Erdogan, a lot of debate around whether he's a ten or he's an eight. And we did a big thing on this, I think, when we beat Wolves 2-1. I said, for me, he's an eight because he can create chances, but he's not, for me, the person I want to just constantly get into pockets and create, create, create. I want him to control tempo. I want him to do a lot of things. And when the openings are there, he can create. Now, 
He doesn't get an assist for this. It results in a penalty. But Erdegaard, for me, has made this goal happen. As is Kai Havertz with his movement. And, you know, OK, everyone deserves credit. Trossard included, Saka for putting it away. But it's like you said, this ball cuts through the lines to Havertz and he takes a touch before he rolls it into Trossard. But what I love about it, we're going to play it again, Havertz has really assumed a, a striker's position there. Like, if you're drawing the five lanes... Well, you don't have a left eight, but you've got Saka, Trossard, Havertz. Havertz very much feels like a straight. He's not looking at the back post here in the way maybe Granit Xhaka did last season. He's making a darting striker's run. He is so often leading the line as a striker for us, Havertz. I think you saw that as well when Martinelli got to the edge of penalty here for the first goal for Erdegaard. Havertz in the box. He's not there trying to underlap and link up with him. He's trying to get on the end of things. And... Like I said, Erdegaard plays a brilliant pass from that area there and rolls into Trossard, who eventually wins a penalty. Just a quick one. Was it a penalty? Did you see enough contact? Yeah, I thought it was a penalty. Yeah. Uh, clear penalty for me. Uh, definitely took him out. And uh, I think we talked about in the past, Arsenal have been predictable in their build-up. Yeah. And now I think with this new dynamic, with uh, the, the elite level of which Odegaard is now playing at in three different phases of our play, we are seeing him able to sort of play balls into our strikers who are now very fluid. The movement's very fluid. Uh, you've got, you've got the, they can attack out wide. Havertz can run in behind, Trossard can follow him in. Then you've got good combinations. I think the Havertz-Trossard partnership is growing actually yeah. in this team. Oh, I totally agree. And one thing I will say, James, it, raise, it raises an interesting debate for me, mm -hmm. you know, around Trossard has now come into the team, I think in 25 starts in Premier League and Europa League in the year he's been at the club. He's made 23 goal contributions, 12 goals, 11 assists. Now, last season, the team evolved with Gabriel Jesus playing in that front line. And yeah. I think he is obviously in our best 11. But how now can you drop Trossard? Trossard is offering something to the team now, which, you know, is equally as good as what Jesus could offer. Certainly in numbers and all the time he's scoring goals. How can you drop him? The relationship with Havertz is building. And I think suddenly last year we thought Zinchenko and Jesus would take us to a new level. With White now inverting in the way that Zinchenko does and Trossard playing, being so fluid as a false nine, dropping into an eight, he can play ten, doing what Jesus does across the front line. We're seeing this team evolve now without Jesus and Zinchenko, which I think is quite interesting. You know? And I thought Saturday, I thought the link-up play between Trossard and Havertz with Odegaard putting the strings was you know, the key part of the game for me. Yeah, he had 88 touches in the game, Erdogan against Burnley with an 85% pass accuracy. Uh, that's three key passes, three ground duels won, two out of three long balls completed with a goal and an assist as well. Erdogan running the show. A couple other great stats. This comes from uh, Amazon Prime, where uh, he's got the most goals and assists of any midfielder since the start of the 22-23 season. I think that's just looking at Premier League with 33, as you can see there. Foden with 31, Pascal Gross with 29, very underrated player, Pascal Gross, De Bruyne and Madison. So he's in great company there. Martin Erdegaard is not just in great company, he's leading the way. Can't help but think that De Bruyne injury might have helped a little bit, but listen, we take it. Erdegaard is playing fantastically and he's in great company. When I ask about the 8-10 thing, for anyone who's again going like, what does it matter, James? It doesn't matter. I just think, let's talk purely on profiles. Forget quality. People can debate in the comment section how he ranks amongst these two players I'm going to mention. Mesut Ozil was a 10. Fabregas was an 8. Now, could Ozil drop deep and control and play? Mate? Yes. Could Fabregas play behind the striker? Yeah. Wenger played him behind the striker at times. But I always saw Fabregas as a creative midfielder in a 4-3-3. And I always saw Ozil as a 10 in a 4-2-3-1 behind the striker. It's a subtle thing, but for me, it's about the areas of the pitch they take up. And Fabregas, no one is for one second saying he's not creative. Erdegaard can be very creative from an eight. Fabregas is one of the most creative players the Premier League's ever seen. But I just think he can be just as good and have just as much of an influence whilst also giving the license to play in these deeper areas. That's why I've been saying since, I think, November, early December, he belongs as an eight for me. But do you get where I'm going with that comparison? I do, two? I get where you're going with that comparison. I think he's the complete all-round midfielder. Uh, yeah. He can play in both uh, positions. And, and I think if you look at his goal contributions uh, since the start of last season, that's 32 now. 20 goals, 12 assists, which is the best of any midfielder in the Premier League. Um, he's now, I think... Uh, Early in the season, we criticised him, did we? Me and you had a few debates about him. Yeah, yeah, was I was, he at I the was level? critical, yeah. But he was coming through an injury. Yeah, he was coming true. back from an injury. 
Now he, he's over that injury, and he's back pulling the strings. I also love his work rate. Mm -hmm. I think he covered something like 11.9 kilometres in yeah. the game yeah. uh, on Saturday, which is a, was the, the most of any player on the pitch. So his work, work rate is phenomenal, phenomenal James. Yeah. Add all that to the skill on the ball and his goals, and, he, and just shows you what a great player he is. And what a wonderful left foot he's got. The mm -hmm. way, I mean, the way he took that goal on Saturday uh, to set us on the way. So for me, he's absolutely, he's an elite player in my opinion. Uh, yeah. And he, he's reaching levels which, you know, I think Arteta trusts him so much. He was the player, and I know we're going to get into this Ozil, you raised the debate around Ozil, uh, and it's a fair debate that, uh, and point you raise. But I can remember when, I know Ozil was at the back end of his Arsenal career, he wasn't doing what Arteta wanted right, in the team. Uh, and that was work rate off the ball to go with his creativity on it and scoring goals. Odegaard, not saying he's a, a better player than Mesut Ozil before Ozil lovers start hating me in the comments. But he's reaching the levels in this team, that I think, and he's delivering what Arteta really wanted from a player in that position, which I don't think Mesut Ozil could do when Arteta came into the club. Let's talk about uh, the rest of the team then, because there's a few who need Serious flowers for their performance. Bakaya Saka, brilliant. Uh, 49 touches, 77% pass accuracy, four duels won, two dribbles completed and another two goals. He is scoring for fun at the moment, but I love this that he sent through. What a stat this is. Since the start of last season, uh, only these players have scored seven goals or more with both their right and their left foot. Bakai Saka's in good company. Seven with his right foot, 18 with his left. Watkins, 15 right, seven left. Hungmin Son, 14 right, seven left. Very two-footed player, Son. Haaland was seven and 34 with his left. Uh, Salah, seven with his right, 25 with his left. He finds himself, a lot of our players are finding themselves in stats, tables and graphics or whatever with the right players. Yeah. That makes me very happy. That tells me that we've got some real, real talent here. Yeah, I will throw another stat in there for you. I think since the start of last season, I think we're looking at goal contributions now, that's goals and assists. Mm -hmm. Only Salah, Haaland have scored or assisted more goals than him in the Premier League. Uh, he's level with Ollie Watkins on 44 goal contributions in the Premier League since the start of last season. Salah has 55, I believe, and Haaland 65, main, mainly goals for Haaland, obviously. But that's, he's up there in all the numbers. We had this debate last week, didn't we? Yeah, yeah. I love that, actually, because me and you started the debate on the show, but Foden and Saka. Uh, who is saying Rio Ferdinand's watching And then Rio, Rio Ferdinand <laughs> was straight on it two days later. But, you know, and, and, I, and I'll be honest with you, I don't think he quite is yet world class. But I'm with you. I don't but, think he's But I there. think he's delivering world class numbers. Yeah. And that's one thing I will say. Fair enough. Uh, I want to shout out two players. And for anyone who's thinking, James Graham, they deserve more time, they deserve more praise, they deserve more of your energy in this show. I agree, we can't talk, I mean, because there's a lot of players we could talk about. I think Havertz, you could talk about his, his tactical role in this, Declan Rice being brilliant again, what Trossard is doing for this team, Trossard versus Jesus. You can have all these conversations, but the two I just want to mention, Jakub Kivior, who is really, really doing well. I think settling in nicely, definitely suits the dynamic of white inverting and playing on the left of the back three. So good on him. And David Raya, who we mentioned that he's very protected and untroubled and, and sure, you know, he's been giving a lot of help by the structure and the team in front, but claims his crosses, distribution, wow. Wow, really, really good. Um, so I just wanted to shout out those two. And there. I'll add one more to your list. Yeah, it's true. Benjamin White. And I think the reason why I say that is because we talked last week about whatever Arsenal did in Dubai, it's obviously working. He was looking a bit unfit before he went to Dubai. Yeah. He's come back from Dubai. He's got himself fit. And he's now added a level to this team in this dynamic, this, this dynamic on the right-hand side with Odegaard and Saka. It was there last year. But I thought last year it was, a, it was there up here Yeah. when he was up high. Yeah. And Saka would come inside and he'd go overlapping out there. Yeah. That was a dynamic last year, but credit to Ben White because in his previous clubs he could play this centre mid role, yeah. and now he's been so flexible yeah. with Odegaard that he's coming in here when Odegaard wants to go high in the two inverting, mm -hmm. and when Odegaard comes back to help build the attack, he can even go in here. Yeah. So I think a big shout out for Ben White. I think he's been absolutely brilliant since the, since yeah. the Dubai break. Absolutely phenomenal. Now, this could be a whole show in itself, but. Compared to last season, after 25 games, this is really interesting what you sent through. I think for a lot of this season, people have been comparing Arsenal 23-24 to Arsenal 22-23. And there's been a lot of, you know, we're just simply not as good. We're not scoring as many goals. The stats say we're not as good. We don't look as good on the eye. 
But things can change very quickly in football. Now, admittedly, a few big games, big wins, 6 0, 5 0, can maybe skew the results slightly. But is it that Arsenal are hitting a run now? And are we looking more complete than we did last season? I know your conclusion to this data, so I'm going to bring you in on it. But we've got less, two less points than we did last season, 55 to 57, as you can see there. But better XG, better by 1.9. We scored three more goals. We've conceded four less goals. We've got an expected goal difference of 8.7 better than last season's expected goals. And we've got a goal difference of one better than last season. So we're two points worse off. But what are those numbers telling us maybe, Graham? Well, I think for me, and I, and I said that to you, and I looked at these numbers and I thought a title bid is more sustainable when you look at these sort of stats than last year. Um, so I think the numbers are showing us to be uh, not only controlling games and dominating games, we're now scoring goals. Um, the goal difference, we have to mention that at the weekend, took a massive upturn. Uh, we're now ahead of Man City. Um, ahead of Liverpool. It's interesting that we're on plus 36 and Man United on plus one. Is that it? Yeah, something like that. Uh, and are, are we Spurs are still on no league titles for nearly <laughs> could 60, help odd, 60 odd years. But, but, but Better than it, Liverpool as well, the, by the, the way. The point, the point I'm making it, yeah, it, 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 is that um, is I think this model, those numbers, I think to me, tell me that uh, we've got a more sustainable chance or better chance of winning the Premier League with these numbers. Uh, and I think it boils down to two things. It boils down to... The, the fluidity now and, the, and uh, the less predictability in the way we're attacking and we suddenly started uh, scoring goals, but also the way that we're differently set up now so we're not likely to concede goals in the way we did at the back end of last season. I will throw one other little uh, thing into the debate. And is we were there last season and lost it. You can say what you like, bottled it, or just fell away at the end, whatever you want to say. But I think that experience will... I think help the team this season towards the back end of the season because I think we are no doubt about it there are three great teams in this title race now Man City Liverpool and Arsenal well I hope so but even with that there that graph that we just showed 57 points after 25 games you can look at that and go with two points worse off but for context we had 50 points after 19 games so only seven more points were picked up it looks like in those six games after if I'm doing the maths in my head right so essentially we made a blistering start but we weren't able to maintain that momentum if we have more sustainably almost crept up to 55, building momentum, the hope is that actually what was a first half of last season got us 50 points but ended with 34 points in the final 19 games in the second half of the season, can we actually end with that better momentum and have a far, far, far better second half to last season's second half that far outweighs what we did? And actually this whole we're two points behind, maybe we're actually on a better trajectory of momentum, but that's all ifs, buts and maybes and also perhaps a more... Uh, positive way of looking at it. The point is, we are two points behind last season, but I agree with you. I think some of those numbers are really, really positive. The roundup stats, Graham, take it away. Yeah, just one thing before I go to the roundup stats. Mm -hmm. I will say that the next four games, I think, are crucial for Arsenal. Mm -hmm. I think we've got three home games. Mm -hmm. I think we play Newcastle, Brentford and Chelsea. Okay. Uh, and then we've got Sheffield United away. Because then after those four games, we go to Man City. The one thing I will say is Man City have got a far easier run in than the other two clubs, uh, again. And Arsenal's running last season was the thing that was part of the problem, that we mm -hmm. had to go to Liverpool, we had to go to Newcastle, for example. Um, and we had West Ham away as well. We had a, I thought we had a harder run in and we got that again. But I just think that we're, the team is better set up to cope with that this mm -hmm. season. So, yeah. yeah, it'd be interesting to see how it pans out. But I think the next four games, James, are crucial. I think if we could get four wins on the board, you know, uh, it will stand us up stead. That would stand be nine good, wins in a row. Yeah, give us, we'll stand us in good stead as we hit that more trickier period of fixtures. Totally agree. Closing stats for this week then, James. Arsenal have won the first five league games in a calendar year for the first time in their history. Lovely. Arsenal's 24 set-piece goals, including penalties, is their most in a campaign since 2004-2005. Leo Trossard has now scored four goals in his last Premier League last five Premier League games. Only Forrest away did he fail to score, and I think he's now scored three and three. He's finding some real form, James. Mm -hmm. And finally, since the start of last season, only six players have been involved in more Premier League goals than Martin Odegaard's 32, which I mentioned, 20 goals and 12 assists, which is the most of any midfielder in the competition. 
Lovely, lovely stats, another lovely win, and a lovely five wins in a row, which has made Tactical Insight a lot of fun to put together. <laughs> if you've enjoyed it as well, hit the like button. A big thanks to everyone who's tuned in, get in the comment section. We are there replying and reading, you'll see us there. So a big thank you to everyone who is sending in comments, sending lovely feedback. It's not even just via the comments, via social media, we do see it. So a big, big thank you to all. And subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet, because that's how you get updates on everything we're doing. Of course, it's Champions League time and there will be some sort of breakdown on the game come the end of the week after we play Porto. So we're in the thick of it. The season is well and truly on its way.